Well, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, it's uh, been a little while. It's been quite a hectic couple of weeks. Uh, if you're wondering, before I get into the actual review here, um, in case you're wondering why it's been delayed, if you haven't listened to all my videos, I do live on the Jersey Shore. I go right down the street, I can, I'm can. i at the Barnegat Bay, and I can actually see sea, uh, Seaside Heights, or what's left of it now. I don't know, they don't let us over there right now. Um, so we had Hurricane Sandy come through, and, well, I didn't have power for over a week. And then, Well, for actually for about one week, power came back on. I was having already computer problems before that. And power came on for about ooh, 15 hours. And then a nor'eastern came, knocked down another branch down the street, and took out my power again for another couple days. And then I had double shifts at work, so it... I got power back, like, two days ago. I did see Skyfall, which is why I'm reviewing it, but a little update about what's going on here. Um, it was kind of scary. <laughs> I actually wound up having to uh, leave the house, go to a hurricane shelter the night of the hurricane, because the bay was coming up down the street. <laughs> In fact, it got on... Luckily, my house is on a bit of a mound, so it never actually... The water never got to the house, though it did get on the front lawn. Like, we had probably go about six inches of from the street to my, the actual house, there's a good foot height that you get on this little mound that they put the house on, so uh, that kind of saved us there. No no damage, just having to sit in the dark with no computer. <laughs> but I did manage to catch Skyfall. Uh, this is really the first opportunity I've actually had to sit and, and, and record the interview, so I know I'm a little late on that. I do apologize, but I also wanted to update everyone on why I wasn't around for a couple days. Still haven't seen Cloud Atlas. Uh, I, it, I had all these plans. I was, I was going to do some uh, horror movie reviews for Halloween. That got shot in the, uh, in the kicker. Then I was going to do, yeah, leading up for the Bond release, I was going to do some James Bond reviews leading up to that, and uh, I had all these grand plans and came to nothing. But anyway, let's talk about Skyfall, which was amazing. Uh, really, one of the... Uh, one of the better Bond movies out there. Uh, personally, I still like Casino Royale for the Craig movies. I think most people agree on that. I mean, I think Casino Royale is probably gonna is in the annals of Bond lore is gonna be one of those Bond films that people continually debate. What is the best Bond? Is it Goldfinger? Is it Doctor No? Is it Casino Royale? Uh, it's one of the ones I think will be one of the few Sean, non-Sean Connery films that is legitimately debated as being the best Bond film. It, I think it's, certainly when people make the, le the lists of like the, the ten best Bond films, I think Casino Royale will be in it, but I think Skyfall is also going to be pretty high up there, if, if not being debated as number four. And it's deserving. There's some elements I, I wish they improved for, uh, for a Bond film, but this one works. It still sticks with the overall realism tone. Uh, there's no doomsday weapon. Although, Javier Ben... Uh, wait, I always mispronounce his name. <laughs> uh, Javier Bardem's character is a bit of a... OP hacker? Mary Sue hacker, I guess you want to say? Yeah, I, call it, I like to call it Hollywood hacking. It's like, how is this... He's just able to do all this crazy stuff with computers, and it's... I think in this movie, that's like the one weak point, is you don't buy the hacking angle, angle that he's this great hacker type thing. I think they needed to, to build more a bit with that techno aspect of his character a bit. Um, maybe understand how he's such a hacker element to it with it's kind of lazy Hollywood writing when it comes to hacking it's like they just assume it's magic uh, only real problem I have with his character because the performance he does is intimidating as hell uh, though I, I think that it would have done a little bit better if they built him up a little bit more uh, the idea that there is this mystery agent that's able to who we know it's somebody I think this is maybe a little bit more of a build up before we actually meet him. But when you do first meet uh Javier Bradem's Silva for the first time, there's a really great scene where he it's one solid shot. He enters this room full of server racks and he has this little tale he tells as he slowly approaches Bond about how his 
mother or his grandmother used to have an island and how they got rid of the rats. And then it gets awkward. <laughs> this is the 800 pound gorilla in the room that I, you have to talk about. <laughs> and I think it's interesting how they play this because even I'm not sure how they were, if he was 100% legit, but he kind of implies that he wants to, to have sex with James Bond. <laughs> we might have a first openly gay James Bond villain. Or he, it's either that or you could easily also interpret that that scene as he's just trying to make Bond uncomfortable. So he's just throwing this little, this weird stuff, like getting really close. He's getting into to Bond's crotch area. He starts feeling up his chest. Like first he's just, first he just uh, looks at the bullet hole from earlier where, jump, where Bond got shot. And that's like a classic thing. Like, ah, see, I know where you are hurt. I think they've even done that in, uh, they, I think they've done that in a previous Bond movie. But they, you know, that's a normal scene. And at first you're like, oh, Okay, yeah, and then he then he moves over to the other side and he starts like rubbing Bond's chest, <laughs> and you're like, uh, uh, where's this going? <laughs> he starts like he starts like feeling up Bond's shave like on his chin. It gets, and you can you can interpret that kind of like how boxers before a fight start getting like really close, and sometimes they even do like the little fake like the little kiss thing to try to make the other guy nervous. So you could easily interpret it that that's what they're doing. They're trying to like, make the other guy nervous through homophobia. Or, hey, maybe he's a gay agent. And I guess, you know, I'm not gay, but I'm assuming gay men probably would want to have sex with Daniel Craig, too. Hey, 21st century. 21st century villain. <laughs> Although he's... Silva there is all types of fucked up. Uh, he's He's got some issues. Uh, so you could interpret that as maybe having some mommy issues with uh, with Judy Dench's character, uh, who she does a very good final performance on her. Spoiler alerts, as usual, my reviews of spoiler alerts. Although I think it was known that this, they were. I think as soon as they announced that Ra uh, Ralph Fiennes was going to be in this, and they kind of showed his his what his character was going to be, everyone was kind of like being they're setting him up to be the next M, and that's fine. I, so. I, he, I even assumed that, okay, by the end of this movie, Ralph Fiennes is going to be the new M. Which is, you know, they do that. They've, they've done retirements before on screen. Uh, die Another Day. Not Die, no, 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 not die Another Day. Uh, sorry. Um, the World is Not Enough. Perfect example there where uh, the original Q retires. He has this wonderful little, quick little scene where he kind of passes the torch to uh, John Cleese, who unfortunately only got the two movies uh, before uh, Ben Winshaw here takes over, which I'll get to in a second, but it's alright, It's and I think the Bond movies, with that establishment, had done a really good job at showing how you should pass the torch to a new character, and a new character becomes the new Q, the new M, and I think that was how they are doing it. I wasn't expecting, and again, I gave the spoiler alert, Judy Dench to die. I was expecting them to kind of like wrap this up and, you know, I was expecting by the end of the movie she would survive and be wrapped up and she would kind of leave now uh, feeling fulfilled or feeling that her time has kind of passed. She's kind of caused these problems with her own personal ambition and ruthlessness. Maybe it is time to let guy, someone like Ralph Fiennes' character who seems to maybe know the world a little bit better, uh, the modern, you know, how he both kind of shows that he knows the core of what Judy Dench's M uh, is all about, that some of the old Cold War style tactics is human intelligent, it's still important, but he maybe is more prepared for the political realities of a modern war, or a modern world. So she decides to pass. I was expecting that. Instead we have her Ralph Fiennes, I think, still establishes that character. He's still a bit of a... I mean, he, there's this, like, shootout in this uh, hearing room, and Ralph Fiennes just picks up a gun and just joins in on the shootout. <laughs> so, fun to see that happen. Lord Voldemort with a gun. Actually, he's had lots of guns in his career. But, uh, unfortunately, Judy Dench dies, and I, I was kind of disappointed by that. You kind of want a lot of these characters, the ideal that they just... They've won and they've earned a nice retirement somewhere, and they're also and they're sitting on a beach. In in some ways, we finally got to see that with uh, 
and this is my own personal interpretation of the can canon, which is another thing I have to get into in a second, but uh, uh, Never Say Never Again, which is an unofficial Bond entry with Sean Connery as James Bond. It, it has to do with a very weird deal Ian Fleming worked out where he sold the bond, the rights to Thunderball, the film rights, an additional film right to another company. Unfortunately, it was just to make Thunderball, so they could only make the one. So they, they gave it a different name, and they changed some elements of the script, but kept enough of the core plot that it was... Still, basically, they could, you know, MGM couldn't slam them going, ah, you made a Bond movie that wasn't Thunderball. But it ends with kind of Sean Connery's Bond finally kind of deciding to retire and give everything up. And it, that movie kind of begins with Bond kind of being like, I'm getting old, this is kind of all that routine. And I kind of always like to imagine that that is canon with, and that was James, the Connery Bond retiring. And then other Bonds took over. And that was a fan theory for a very long time, that maybe James Bond is a cover name that 00s get. Like, if you become 007, you also take on this, uh, this Bond mantra, and you know that becomes your name. Uh... Which I think worked for a while, although, you know, a Casino Royale kind of threw the first wrench in that because Bond was not the double O, and he was, they, people would still refer to him as Bond, unless you could make up the argument that, you know, they gave prospective recruits, you know, if they were going to get a certain double O signature, they would be, you know, during their first pre, before they were, they were given like the name before, yeah, this is how people worked it out. Before you were given the double O distinction, you first earned a cover identity, and the cover identity would be James Bond. And then if you were successful as the cover identity, you got the double O license. And I guess that would explain, like, gaps in the in the plot lines. Because you did have Judy Dench take over, so you have Judy Dench, maybe Pierce Brosnan's guy retired, and she's looking to replace now the Bond with another Bond. You know, maybe there's like a, maybe there's a pool of James Bonds out there. You could always make the argument that they, you know, they recruit like the same personality type because it tends to work, which is why the Bonds kind of always have the same personality. But oh well, you know, I don't sweat it too much. I can have my own little people. People can have contradictory thoughts in their mind. It's amazing. No, read Orwell. He he goes into that a lot with. 1984, you can have weird contradictory things floating around in your head and it all makes sense somehow. Doesn't necessarily reflect reality, but hey, <laughs> I digress, as I usually do. Um, so we see Duty Gent die, and I was disappointed by that. I didn't want to see her kind of retire, but I, and I was I was very happy to see Ralph Fiennes take over as a new album. I think he has a very good presence as both a man who you can believe in is in the espionage field, who maybe has a bit of a danger to him, someone who has that authority, but also you can also buy him as, like, the bureaucrat. He has that weird aspect to him where you can believe he is both a kind of an academic and a field guy at the same time, a good combination. And so for the role of M, great actor to have for that because you want to have M as being someone you want to sympathize. Like, he really knows what he's doing and how he assigns people to do their stuff. Uh, of course, he's got the, you know, the concerns of more overall agency, and maybe for Bond, so that can clash with Bond, but a guy who you can still believe is legit legit for the role a bit. And especially as, as Ralph Fiennes, I think he even, there's a little quib in there about, like, you know, even, you know, you should go into field. Oh, it's a young man's game. I think that kind of goes. He was considered for Bond, I think, during either for when Craig was going to take over the role or when, Oh, uh, Broswin. Uh, Bro I, could, ah, I can't speak today. Uh, was going for the role. He was one of the actors that was uh, considered for it, but uh, he lost out. But I think as an M, especially as he ages, if he decides to, like, if he decides to, to keep the role and go with it for, you know, next couple decades, I mean, let's face it, the M parts of the movie don't take up that much. You know, he can, f he can fit that into his schedule. Especially, especially, he, he is an especially an actor like him, because he's an actor, like one of those actors, 
who will appear in a ton of movies, and you're like, oh, wait, Ralph, Ralph Fiennes is in this. So I could easily see him doing this for the next 20 years. Uh, you know, Judy Dench was up there. She she was at 77 before she retired, so Ralph Fiennes, if he sticks with it, he might be there for a very long time. If he decides to stick with it. I think he will. I think taking on that Emerald, I think it's almost kind of implied, hey, you're going to be doing these movies now until, like, you're, you're pretty retired. And let's face it, for when it comes to James Bond, most actors are like, well, I'll stay, I'll do that role every time a movie comes up. Uh, we also have a new Monty Penny, of course, which we didn't get the name revealed until late in the movie. Uh, she starts off as, like, a field agent. I kind of don't like that element. Maybe if she if they stick with her for the next movie, I'll be we'll see how she rolls if she fits better in with that whole uh, secretary role. But I don't know. I think the the field ele, the field agent element of her. Yeah, you know, at the end of the movie, she kind of acknowledges that she's gonna stick behind a desk. Uh, she, in fact, she's the one that actually ends up shooting James Bond, which adds a whole new element to that relationship. Awkward. But, uh... I don't think it matters that she's a black actress. Actually, I don't think anyone's brought that up, but I was ex I was expecting more, like, furor on the internet going, Oh, they just cast Monty Penny black because they wanted to make it multiracial, you know. That type of BS arguments. She seemed like a fine enough actress, uh... Very fine. I'm happy with the. Uh, I'm happy with her. I, well, I'm not happy with her. I'm gonna give her another movie. <laughs> I'll put it that way. I think the parts with her in the field, and then her, revealing in the end she's Monty Penny, it doesn't feel like the Monty Penny fit. You expect Monty Penny to be a little bit more on the administrative side, feeling like she doesn't really get into the field, but she handles. She makes. She makes MI6 run. You know, that's what that character's supposed to be. You know, M, fine, you can make, you know, he, of course, is also making it run, but it's great to have that element where he knows something about the field as well. But, I mean, Money Penny, I think that character should be more based on, she's much more of just an administrative person and not really ever go, you know, field type. I think that's just the character, not, you know, what her place is. Obviously, I had no problem with uh, Judy Dench's M running things. I think she did a very good job, starting off with Goldeneye. Now to get to Q, which is probably the most dramatic change for any of the characters they've done since Judy Dench became M, only because M uh, Q has always been played by older actors. Uh, yeah, the original, of course. The O is uh, what was his name? Uh, Alec McCohen. No, not Alec McCone. He was never seen ever again. Uh, Desmond <laughs> Ulin. So actually, there has been four cues, but uh, Desmond Ulin and John Cheese, uh, John Cleese are the two main ones. Uh, both were older. John Cleese, of course, was much older when he took over the role. I would have been happy if they brought him back. I think he was always a good fit for for Q. They started him off with unofficially being called R and then formally becoming the Quartermaster. Uh, but when Ben uh, Wishaw here, very young, I don't know about him either as Q, if only because I think they threw, you know, this is the problem with the uh, the modern Bonds, they don't do as much gadgets. And in, in reality, they kind of do this, oh, it's much more realistic, much more high-tech. If you've seen some of the stuff in the spy museums, you know that the James Bond stuff isn't that far off from some of the stuff they developed. Um, you know, the the eyeglass cameras and all this other crazy stuff that they've developed for espionage over the years. To get us give, I mean, they do at least give two gadgets this time. It's almost like they had to relent. They had Q. They had to bring Q back, so they had to make him have two um, guns or two uh, two at least some sort of gadgets. And the one they have is. You know, the Walter PPK, and they added as that only he can shoot it. Very practical, and they, they at least play that into effect. And I like that element that they brought back. I think that, uh, was it? 
that was from though that was somewhat of a reference to oh god what was his uh, license to kill that's where they had the sniper rifle where only he could shoot it and then he had a small radio transmitter which is you're kind of like doesn't bond have a cell phone you can call anywhere you can call for help in any world give bond a cell phone then Although he does kind of play it. They they do kind of at least show it off as Bond being, you know, he uses, hey, this is the latest thing from Q Branch. It's called a radio. Because he hits the button, he gets assistance flying on in. Uh, you would have, I would have liked to see at least a couple more gadgets, or at least maybe something like put that, put that radio transmission device, a, uh, give it a, give it a ring or something. You know, something. Maybe in the next one. As for his performance, I think the only thing that threw me off is he's a little bit more of a, well, we don't do that silly stuff anymore. Exploding pens. I was like, oh, exploding pens is one of the coolest things they ever did. The exploding pen. But overall, the performance wasn't bad. Uh, of course, every scene was stolen by uh, Javier Bardem, but it just looked kind of, both kind of crazy, especially when he's at the very end when he confronts uh, Judy Dench. He has it, when he realized she was wounded because he wanted it, he needed to be the one to like shoot her. He gets all freaked out that she's hurt because somebody else hurt her. And he even has this really weird thing where he can't shoot her. He has got two opportunities in the movie. He has his original plan when he bursts into uh, the conference room or the hearing room, and he's gonna shoot her. He has her dead to rights, but he hesitates. He can't pull the trigger, and that gives everyone else enough time to react, and he misses his opportunity. And then at the end, he corners her in the church. He still can't pull it. So instead, he tries to pull this murder-suicide routine where he sticks the gun in her hand and he you know, puts it on her head, and it, but he puts his head next to her, so if she pulls it, she'll kill both of them. And he has this weird element where he can't quite kill her. But it's very intense. It makes you very, like, this is a character that's completely unhinged, which is really good to do for that type of uh, villain. Now, this movie's also, of course, added on to a bit of the overall Bond lore. And although they said this wasn't a sequel to Casino Royale, they're using a plot, a lot of plot exposition elements from Casino Royale and recalling them back in this movie. Oh yes, you were, uh, you were an orphan, that's why we chose you, which is what they said in the previous movie and such. Or which, which they said in Casino Royale. So you do have elements of Casino Royale popping back up in here. And we get to know what Skyfall actually is. Um, everyone, I think, was assuming going in that Skyfall would have been like just the uh, the title of the operation. Oh, you know, this is Operation Skyfall. Because the sky is falling because our agents are being revealed, which actually turned out to be not as big of a plot point as I thought it was going to be. Instead, Skyfall is actually the name of Bond's ancestral home. So they actually, and we get to we get to see it, it is confirmed to be in Scotland. Uh, we show that yeah, Bond, it was under his name, but he never really went back there, and that's where they all, all the uh, final shootouts take place. And really, that's where the cinematography shines. Uh, this movie is beautifully shot, but the ending action scene, where especially after the house is being burnt up and they're in like the marsh lands or the highlands outside of the marsh, there's this wonderful cinematography and wonderful lighting they do with all the characters being lit by the fire in the distance. And it has this really great um, atmospheric element to it. You know, that type of... If you're ever like in a camp and you have a good big fire rolling where everything... Near the fire has that very interesting orange light on everybody, but the background is this pitch black. It's that weird um, thing where your your eyes they see darkness, but there's so much light that the the irises are are close enough so that everything further out looks very dark because not enough light is getting reflected back from further out in the distance. So you have this very weird where everything close by is very easily seen, but with a bit of an orange tinge. And everything further out is almost pitch black. It's a really, really well shot scene. In fact, it was one, certainly one of the best well shot uh, Bond movies. 
Let's see what else. I've talked about that. We've talked about all the characters. Uh, yeah, the only thing I think to really criticize this movie is it's another. It seems like it's another origin story, and we've already told the origin story a bit. Now, this might be because it's a bit of a throwback. There's a ton of little little references here. They're not as bad as in To Die, in a, uh, Die Another Day, where it was this... Oh, really? You did that one? Uh, let's... It was well done. Let's face it, Die Another Day is probably at the bottom of the pile. Sorry, Brosnan. But... This one handles a lot better. There's plenty of references, although they don't force themselves to make a reference to every movie. There's plenty of references uh, in through dialogue, through little things in the background. Of course, at the very end, they have basically the old school office from the original Bond uh, series. Uh, Connery and Roger Moore era. Uh, Lazenby, too. So they have that back. I'll be curious to see if they bring it back in the next one. Or if they decide just to have that as the temper, like, oh well, since MI6, the office is blown up, so, uh, you know, we had to use that old Universal Export office for just a couple months while they refinish this, this one. Because, you know, next one it is should be, you don't have to establish and have Bombi Bond. In fact, I thought that was the whole point of, uh, uh, Quantum of Solace was like, okay, Casino Royale, Bond becomes Bond. And I believe in, in Quantum of Solace, I, I bought it that, okay, this is this is Bond now as Bond doing his Bond thing. I think, hopefully, now that everyone... Okay, we have now reset everybody. Now we can really get back into the whole Bond. We don't have to reestablish anything, any of that stuff in the next Bond movie. And it was promised to us that he will return. So... Do I recommend this movie? Hell yes. Um, as I said, it's not as good as Casino Royale, but Casino Royale is, is arguably one of the best Bond movies out there, and I think this one's going to be right up there with it. Although, I do really like Quantum of Solace. I think as it comes to Bond errors, I really think the Craig error and the the, the Connery error are going to be argued for a long time, um, unless the next guy is really fantastic as well. Uh, who was the best Bond? I think the the errors, the movies that would have really good movies, I think those two are going to be there. You know, for a while I, saw, I said Brosnan, and I think he gets more flack than he deserves, because Goldeneye, I think most people will agree, is a fairly good Bond movie, a good introduction, and especially dealing with a good way of trying to figure out how to deal with the post Cold War, because Bond was such a Cold War movie or series, even when it wasn't dealing with the Cold War that you know, Golden Eye really had to establish how you do Bond in the modern world. I also really love Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah. First Bond movie I saw in theaters, and I think, you know, had a really good underlying premise. You know, a, a media mogul decides to create wars so he could sell papers. It's, it's wonderful. I love that little plot element. I think Vincent Price, uh, not Vincent Price. Uh, Jonathan Price did a did a good role in that, and I, I think it was under. I, I don't think it got enough credit that it deserves. Um, same thing with the uh, the world is not enough. I, I enjoyed that one immensely as well. Die another day. Yeah, you can you can toss that one under a bus. But uh, I think as time goes by, I think it's still going to be those movies will be viewed a, a bit above more. The more error, but I certainly don't think Craig has established himself as one of the best Bonds out there. I'm sure people out there are going to be arguing. Uh, what's to come? Um, now on the site, or not the site, but the YouTube channel. Uh, I've got a few things. Obviously, a lot of my plans have been thrown under the dust. I had a trailer reaction video for uh, Iron Man which I was, uh, literally the night that I lost power, I was, like, kind of getting ready to put it together, and then it just went poof. <laughs> so, um, I think at this point everyone's analyzed the hell out of that trailer, so the Iron Man 3 trailer, I'm just not going to bother 
I'll probably wind up deleting all that stuff off. Uh, however, the World War Z trailer came out, and uh, expect a quick reaction video to that. Um, if I can catch... Um, Cloud Atlas, I will certainly try to report on it, uh, give a review on it. I think there's a... Some, I'll just see what's coming out this weekend. Because uh, I don't think... I'm not working any... I'm only working one double shift this weekend. Yeah, I work two jobs, and one of them keeps on giving me double shifts on the weekend. At least I'm making money now. I still don't have health insurance. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to do a Resident Evil 6 review. That really got thrown under the... Obviously, with this whole big mess of things... I was getting, I was playing the you know, Resident Evil 6, got through Leon's campaign, was getting through Chris's campaign, and the power outage happened. I was, I might still do a review for that. Uh, I'm also, it might see a book review on here. Just because yeah, I was out of power for a while, and I started reading some books. And I've read the first Tom Clancy book I've ever read, surprisingly. Uh, I've got to finish up with the last, like, literally a couple chapters, but I think I actually want to do a book review for once. And that's kind of site news for now. Uh, I have a bunch of pictures from, obviously, uh, the aftermath of Sandy, although not as dramatic as um, anything that you've probably seen on it. Well, maybe a few of them are worthy there. I have a couple of pictures of boats sitting in people's yards. <laughs> I might make a quick video of them real fast, throw it on there, but, uh, you know, I haven't been, don't ask me about Seaside Heights. There, it's, if you've, remember the Dark Knight Rises, they're trying to, you know, they have that bridge at the end, uh, near the end that they, they're trying to get the kids across, and they have that checkpoint. If you go to the bridge that takes you over to Seaside, it looks like that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a military-style checkpoint they have set up there, and you can't get across. <laughs> You've got to show a residential ID. Uh, you know, they're not letting the general public cross there right now. So don't ask me how Seaside is. You, if you've seen it on the news, that's about it. The, I, the only thing I can tell you is that there's a lot of cranes over in Seaside, because that's what I can see from where I'm at, is this a lot of cranes over there now. And, well, and, and the, the Ferris wheel is still standing. Not sure how stable it is, but I can see the Ferris wheel still. So... Finally got power back. Hopefully all this stuff has been sorted out routine. Skyfall was at least great, so yeah. Great way to come back. Yeah, you know, from after having all that, it's great to have come back and actually see a good movie. Although it tends to be whenever I see bad movies, the rare times that I, I actually get pissed off at a movie and complain they get the most credit. Or I get I get more views. Maybe I should see more crappy movies then. Oh well. I'm rambling on killing time. That's the site news. You have my review for Skyfall. Uh, stay tuned for more stuff. Signing off.